Patients include Berbers and others known as tribe and nation in the Maghreb. The architecture and memory of the minority quarter of the Eastern Mediterranean city and disorienting encounters, travels of the Moroccan scholar in France in 1845-1846. The work has been translated into Arabic, Spanish, French, and Chinese. <laughs> Professor Miller is the recipient of two Fulbright Awards and fellowships, in, including ones from the Social Science Research Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Council of Learned Societies. In 2006, she was awarded the annual prize of the Abu Dhabi Cultural Foundation for writing on Arabic travel literature, and her most recent book, A History of Modern Morocco, received the um, El Carl Brown Prize Honorable Mention from the American Institute of Maghrebic Studies. Professor Miller's current, current project on which she will speak today is a biography of Helene Hazes de Natal, the first Moroccan woman lawyer who organized a humanitarian program in Morocco during World War II that directed refugees from Europe to safe heaven in the Western Hemisphere. Her paper is titled The Water Refugee Crisis in the Western Maghreb. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mila. Uh, Professor Mila, would you mind maybe switching uh, seats with the uh, Mabun so that the camera will touch your speak? Sure. <laughs> I don't know if I have no choice. It's almost. You have no choice. No, you have no choice. No, 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 no. no. I don't know if I'm going to fit in you to a big place. No, I don't know. If I <laughs> Maybe I'll take some of Daniel's curves <laughs> to protect me against the aspersions of Yarana. I'm <laughs> speaking is really historical, <laughs> historical efforts. Uh, uh, that wasn't my intention, Carol. Uh, you are a pillar of our uh, work, and uh, you're a voice from the inside that we all turn to and look to for setting a course and direction uh, in, in whatever whatever you do. But I think there is a point that there are many scholars now who are not readers of Hebrew who are very interested in this topic, who are not historians but work in other fields, alive fields. Uh, and uh, I, I would really hope that your very important works uh, on, on, the, uh, on the World War II and after could be, could be translated uh, to English to, to help uh, reorient that. Uh, I'm also very happy to be here and thanks to Mayor and Ben for this opportunity and all the staff has been so kind and it's very nice to see a new generation of Israeli scholars, uh, graduate students here that are so interested in, in our work. That's always very gratifying to see, that, um, to see uh, uh, your uh, one's work go, go onward in, in new vessels. Um, my project is about the refugee crisis in Morocco during World War II, uh, and I see it as uh, an entry point into understanding wartime experience for Jews in Morocco in, in general, uh, on an open portal. It, 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 this uh, project on refugees that I started a couple of years ago eliminates a variety of relationships within Moroccan Jewry in Morocco. Uh, that are important. It, it has tentacles and questions about the relations within the Jewish communities of Morocco with each other, uh, to the Vichy authorities, uh, and to uh, the Allies after November 42, and to the organization of the exodus uh, the post-war, which I'll speak about in a moment. Uh, it also relates to uh, relations between international relief agencies, like the Joint, uh, the, uh, Quakers, the Hesem, the American Jewish community, and local entities, so there is an international aspect to this project. And finally, uh, it, it touches on the situation of Moroccan Jews vis-a-vis uh, -vis changes in, on a global scale, and, it, it, uh, uh, and to my mind, it, it, these changes can be well understood through questions of refugees, displacement, migration, and I'll make this point, I hope, a little clearer uh, as I get into it. Uh, refugees are one pole of my research. The other pole of my research is this very extraordinary person um, that I found in the archives uh, initially in the, uh, in the uh, Moroccan uh, State Archive, the Protectorate Archives. Her name is Helene Kazes Benatar. She's not exactly a household word, 
but I hope she will do by the time uh, I'm done with her. She's an extraordinary figure, um, and her role in uh, uh, refugee relief was, was central, but she also, like a refugee question, has tentacles into many other areas that are relevant um, uh, to uh, understanding the situation of Moroccan Jewry during the war. She's a, a portal into understanding the sensibility, I think, of native Jews. Her personal story frames critical questions um, about how Jews felt, imagined, and experienced uh, the war and redefined themselves over the course of the war, the kinds of um, uh, changes in consciousness that you were discussing in your uh, very fine introductory remarks, Samir. Uh, and how uh, these wartime experiences were not only a rupture, they're usually uh, described as a rupture, but also a bridge um, uh, to the post-war period and a, a way of tying together their past and future selves. So, uh, so uh, this project, I think, on another level uh, as well, if I may continue with this train of thought of how this, uh, my work is implicated in a variety of settings, uh, also in involves um, the shift to a Zionist perspective in North Africa, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, what happened during the war, um, the rise of uh, Moroccan nationalism and the transformations within colonial rule that took place during the war, and the Jewish reaction to both factors, uh, questions of Jewish, religious, and social identity during the war, and something we haven't mentioned so far, which is the question of Ashkenazi and Sephardi, if I may put it that way, relations, and the, uh, the um, the emergence of Moroccan Jews onto an international scene where they confronted an Ashkenazi world in the person in the in the form of the international aid organization. So um, th this this project I hope will help us uh, rethink important facets of uh, the war in Morocco, including how Moroccan Jews moved from a pre to a post-war reality that marked a radical uh, departure from previous conceptions of uh, time and space, uh, of the Moroccan time and space. And uh, I would argue that this fundamental shift in mentalities allowed them to imagine life in a world beyond Morocco, whose outlines were slowly revealed uh, over the course of the war. And I'll try and be a bit more specific about that. Something about uh, Ellen Kaze's Benatar, it, it, it was, it, she's depicted in the, the literature in a very sketchy way. Uh, Michel Abadbo uh, contributes a paragraph in his survey of North Africa to her, says she's an important person. He doesn't say why and what she, exactly what she did, but you know, the lies over her. Um, everyone agrees she's exceptional, but nobody really says why. Uh, she, uh, Ken Eve mentions her. Uh, these are two references. Uh, that uh, indicate her importance. Uh, she was a, a lawyer. She was the first Moroccan lawyer, not the first Moroccan Jewish lawyer, the first Moroccan woman lawyer. First Moroccan woman to pass the bar. She came from a prominent family in, uh, uh, in Tangier, which in itself is a cultural definer. Um, she lost her job as a lawyer because of the Vichy race laws. She was the only woman debarred by the Vichy race laws, I found her name on a list of lawyers who were debarred. So she sought another means of livelihood in her personal life. The war uh, coincided with the loss of her husband. She became the sole support of her family. At the same time uh, that uh, she lost her livelihood, her community was in, uh, in crisis. The Jewish community of Casablanca uh, entered a period of crisis in 1940 with the, the waves of refugees that were fleeing uh, Europe, many of them arriving in Casablanca uh, from Europe, especially France. Also, Spanish Republicans arriving in Morocco, communists, uh, Evades, people who were uh, Jews from the French army that uh, escaped, ran away, and came to Morocco. Groups of, of, uh, of people called Travailleurs that were units of Moroccan, of, excuse me, European Ashkenazi Jews who uh, tried to uh, escape being uh, sent to uh, deported by joining uh, French work units. There are thousands of refugees coming to Morocco. We've all seen the film Casablanca. This is a pictorial, uh, imaginary, uh, uh, but in many ways a real uh, depiction of the chaos and the excitement and the, uh, and the uh, 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 confusion around uh, the arrival of, 
uh, refugees in, in Morocco, and particularly in Casablanca. No one was caring for these refugees. Uh, uh, Elin Pazit Benatar mobilized uh, local resources, created a committee, linked up with uh, the uh, Hisan and the Hayas, the uh, European Jewish uh, Emigre Associations, developed ways of caring for the refugees, of feeding them, uh, and of transshipping them. Um, if those who had the correct <coughs> visas, uh, she helped get on boats, the few boats that were leaving Morocco and going across the Atlantic. She single-handedly uh, began to mobilize resources, and then others came in and helped. That was the first phase of my, that's the first phase of my interest in her. The second phase is post-1942, uh, and here she was involved in the liberation of the, uh, of the Vichy uh, slave labor camps in, in Morocco, a topic that's been touched on by others, but not investigated uh, in, in any uh, really close sense. She toured them, she documented them, she was a, uh, her, her, she names names, she uh, catalogs, uh, skills and her purpose was to try to get these people liberated from the camps after the American landing in 1942. The Allies were dragging their feet about what to do about these thousands of uh, Europeans, uh, many of them German Jews who were suspicious, uh, held in suspicion by the uh, American authorities as potential uh, uh, third col fifth column. And she worked very hard to try to get people liberated from these camps. And, and, her relationships with, uh, with people in the camps, with the refugees, are all documented in uh, her personal archive, which the original is here in Jerusalem, but uh, a better and more intact copy is now at the Holocaust Museum uh, digitized. So uh, another phase of her life after the war was uh, she, she became involved uh, post-war in, uh, in the immigration of uh, Moroccan Jews uh, out of Morocco when the question uh, of Moroccan Jewry became an internationalist. She was involved in that as well. The qualities she brought to her work were um, exactitude, mental vigor, rigor, legal skills, competence in French. She was a marvelous writer of French uh, legalistic language. She had uh, languages, Spanish, English, and her contacts. She was a member of an elite family and she had contacts all through the uh, power structures in Morocco, not only Jewish, but Muslim as well. Her personality was everything. Um, she didn't have a, a monetary resources, but she had um, personal gifts that allowed her um, to uh, operate on a level that was uh, uh, really extraordinary for a, a woman. Uh, Post-war, in the final phase, she became the spokesperson for the Zionist cause in both Europe and America, a poster child for uh, immigration and for women's activism in the, in the uh, task of immigration. Uh, and she herself was absorbed at this point by larger entities, by the, uh, the joint, by other groups who uh, co-opted her and uh, made her an instrument for their own uh, policies. There are some leading questions that have come forward in my research that I think uh, have wider resonance. Uh, let me mention what they, what they are. Um, and number one is the question of collaboration. Uh, was she a collaborator? Uh, she had many relationships within Vichy. Uh, she used her influence to gain uh, concessions, material for refugees. And she had considerable power. To what extent did she share? information with Vichy authorities? Did this, does this constitute collaboration? This is a question of moral relevance that we you know, need to consider. She had power in which she decided who got on the ships, who didn't, who stayed behind, who got work, who didn't get work, who stayed in the camps, uh, who, uh, who was liberated, who was not. And, and uh, she also, of course, shared a lot of information and collaborated with the Americans uh, after the land. Uh, one could make comparisons with the Jewish leaders in Europe, but uh, they're inevitable. Uh, 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 but of course, they're not on the same scale, and not uh, you can't compare. I don't think it's morally relevant to compare with with, with members of the uh, uh, Jugendrette in, in Europe. But there are similarities. Um, another question is the politics of liberation and her involvement with the, the camps. The question of camps. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, fine, detailed examination of the camps, I think, is in order. Uh, what were the various camps? What were the purposes? What was the rationale behind them? 
and how do they compare with the camps in Europe? Of course, they were not extermination camps. They were labor camps, but they were certainly, it was a system of brutality, and uh, that those who were in those camps were not compensated. I, I believe this is part of the uh, refugee issue. Um, the inner life of camps needs further exploration, and also the memory of them, and to what extent are those memories distorted? I read some uh, temonage uh, testimonies. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, and uh, my own feeling is that they've been stylized, they've been shaped to fit uh, uh, expectations of what uh, uh, many of them follow, a particular narrative arc uh, that's uh, very stereotypical. Uh, and finally, who should assume guilt for these camps? The French have never owned up to having a role in creating or running them. Uh, there's never been any compensation for the victims, and of those who were confined to these camps. Uh, I believe that's also part of the story. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, finally, her uh, involvement uh, in the post-war uh, exodus uh, and the role of uh, uh, international organizations, the, the joint, the HESA, and so forth, in shaping post-war discourses about the Shoah in North Africa. She was co-opted into these systems, and uh, and she contributed to a new discourse, which I'll discuss in just a moment, uh, that um, smoothed the transition between the wartime refugee problem and the post-war exodus issue. I believe that there is a direct link between the refugee experience and the post-war and the post-war uh, mass exodus of Jews uh, from Morocco that conditions were created uh, and, and language language was created a language I would argue that a language of departure was created uh, 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 in the context of the refugee crisis um, that became um, embedded in post-war discourses uh, about um, about the condition of Moroccan Jews. And uh, Benatar was a publicist. She was engaged in this, creating these uh, new discourses. She began to speak about the condition of Moroccan Jews in the same terms that, uh, uh, that were used to describe the situation of European Jews. She talked about danger, about disaster, about death, uh, to describe the situation of Moroccan Jews uh, post-war. And this is a language borrowed from the European situation in, in which the two uh, really weren't comparable uh, at all. And although she herself didn't uh, uh, didn't make Aliyah and will come to Palestine, and she eventually went to France, and uh, she was culturally French. So uh, it's clear uh, to me from uh, this material, from this study so far, the uh, uh, a point I'm trying to will try to make more energetically uh, when uh, when I actually begin to write something about this. Um, that the, 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 the international uh, helping agencies played a major role in shaping uh, historical discourse, historical tradition, in diminishing the native role uh, uh, of people like Benatar, although she herself was complicit in this uh, sort of activity, in defeminizing uh, the project of Russia, refugee relief. Uh, in a sense, this is gender history because women played a really important role, not only in Morocco, but the Quakers, uh, PSEM, uh, all of these agencies, women were really central to the, their activities. And, and it was the men who became the heroes of, of, uh, of both the, uh, uh, the refugee relief in, in Morocco and in the post-war um, exodus. People like Joe Schwartz, they were the people who became uh, the heroes. Uh, so uh, another area of investigation is the nexus between humanitarianism uh, and gender. Uh, in the, the narrative, uh, uh, narrative that emerged post-war, uh, native Jewish sensibilities were displaced, and the nuance that, that Jews themselves, Moroccan Jews, saw in their own situation was removed uh, uh, because one of the options in front of Moroccan Jews post-war was really just simply to stay in place, which many of them did. Uh, but Moroccan Jewry, was, uh, the, the story about them uh, was absorbed into the rhetoric of European relief, I would argue, and there was an elision between uh, the European and the Moroccan situations post-war when they two really were comparable. 
So uh, to sum up the refugee crisis during the war, I would argue set the parameters for conceptualizing the post-war exodus from North Africa to two uh, in quite different unrelated situations. And the elision between what happened to European Jews and what could happen to Moroccan Jews became very instrumental in, in, uh, in uh, historicizing uh, the, uh, the conditions post-war. And uh, even wise observers like Hélène Casas Benatar were co-opted to this particular uh, point of view. Uh, uh, and the refugees uh, left behind an experience and a memory of displacement uh, that now was uh, associated with, uh, by, uh, with, uh, with local Jews in a manner that I feel is quite inappropriate. That is the internationalization of the refugee pro uh, problem in North, North Africa during the war put in place the mechanisms, help put in place the mechanisms to describe and uh, to rationalize the mass exodus uh, of, uh, of post-war. Uh, another thing uh, it, uh, that I would consider is that uh, uh, the uh, concern uh, uh, of people like Helen Helen uh, Kazis Ben Attar uh, at the beginning of the war to create the individuality of each refugee and her her data, uh, the, the, the reports she left behind, very much emphasize the individuality, the personality of each and every uh, uh, refugee uh, that she encountered became in the post-war, in the late uh, uh, latter years of the war, in the post-war year, uh, years, and a kind of, it turned into a kind of an anonymous corporeality, I would say, a vague kind of universal thinking about the refugee body. Uh, and this has been, uh, uh, this is a key transition in thinking uh, that has not been acknowledged, but, uh, uh, but through the life of Helen Kazis Benatar, we can see it become visible and transparent. And that transition from individuality to uni universality is a feature we see that's imposed upon refugee <coughs> situations by, uh, by helping agencies. It, it, it helps their work, facilitates their work, and it makes it easy for them easier for them to make the argument uh, to, to move people. So, so finally, the reproduction and resuscitation of particularistic discourses uh, have been largely uh, ignored by the historiography uh, by, uh, that exists. And, and, and really, if we can re resuscitate these particularistic discourse, discourses, I think we, we could have a very important uh, impact on historical revisionism and how uh, uh, the practices of memory of, of, of the show up in your family can be re examined. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> first question for my mom. Good. Thank you, Susan. This is a this is a really great project. I mean, really, Thanks, Mark. Thanks I'm really, to you. You were so no, helpful to I'm me. really looking forward. I, I really like the gender part. I think it's something that really we miss in this, in basically how we narrate the story of not only of World War II, but mostly post-independence and even the, the, the colonial period. But I, I, think, I think one of the things that really emerged from this project and the way you frame it and you eloquently actually argue this is this idea of bureaucracy and how you have a woman who managed to set up her own bureaucracy how you deal with it, with this with 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 a, with a dossier as huge as as a refugee, but also at some point how he made she made sure that the management of the refugees is also connected to the Quakers and later on to the Americans themselves. So so, so I think I, I really the, the, I want to know more about how if you're if you actually you're going to deal with this in a much more elaborate way, what was her relation to the Quakers? Because the Quakers come later, I think. They come after, she She set up the logistics before the Quakers arrived in 41, I think, or 42. Yeah, she was on the ground already. These other agencies came in, uh, yeah. targets of opportunity. Yeah. The Quakers were not present. In, the joint wasn't even active yeah. in North Africa. And they uh, piggybacked on, on her efforts and eventually and the joint uh, absorbed her. She became a, a joint effort. 
but she was there. She was there the first. She was uh, working alone for uh, months, uh, from June till September, October, uh, when she had first contacts with Nissan before the Quakers. But all of those agencies uh, began to uh, see opportunities in, in North Africa uh, after, uh, after 1941, when the numbers of refugees really skyrocketed. It became obvious that she needed help, and she negotiated with them to bring them on board. She couldn't. At that point, she, she really needed. She was getting no help from the Nishi authorities. Yeah. Um, yes, my question is, is connected to uh, something you said about collaboration. So I was wondering if you could possibly expand on that. Is this something that you found, you found evidence of people using this word at the time, or perhaps afterwards, or you know, she herself even? Like, how is this word being used in this context? Because it just seems to me that during this period, you know, the, or, or thinking about it afterwards, this resistance, collaboration, dichotomy, yes, and something yes. very, um, yes. you know, I think something that we've definitely been trying to overcome yes. uh, in the last 20 years, and as yes. you think about, um, you know, these shit and Jews, and, you know, uh, of course, organizations like Yujif has been sort of branded collaborationist, and et cetera, and I think, you know, I suppose I know much more than I do to do with, um, you know, the people did use the term Yudabat in Tunis to talk about that group, so I was quite surprised to hear. Yeah. Um, you talk about. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I use the term to be provocative. Uh, I don't think she collaborated. I think she uh, collaboration and resistance are two sides of the same coin. I mean, my answer to that, if she were accused of that, but she was accused of it. She was accused uh, by uh, certain refugees of, of use of power, uh, of being too close to the Vichy authorities of making decisions that were not her place to make. Uh, she, uh, in fact, there was another co-worker of hers, uh, Jonathan Torsh, who some of us know, was the editor of La Venia Illustrella, Illustrella, the, uh, uh, the Zionist, yeah. pro-Zionist newspaper, who was actually uh, brought before the, uh, what, WJC? Uh, no, W, the World Zionist Organization, by ex-refugees for uh, uh, dishonesty in handling uh, refugee issues. And that whole uh, procedure is documented in the archives of the Alliance Israelite Universelle in Paris. Uh, when the refugee uh, uh, project got moving, there was a very big flow of money, of cash, Many of these refugees came with large amounts of cash. They were taken away, the money was taken away and put in safety deposit uh, boxes with Ellen Kazi's Benatar name on them. There, uh, there were many opportunities for bribery, for graft, and, and corruption. And we can see the evidence of that in the Torsh uh, files. And he himself was eventually uh, left Morocco under a cloud and migrated to America. Uh, in 1941, uh, and he, his reputation has suffered uh, from the, the, the accusations of having misappropriated funds within the refugee relief. This is, as you know, this is a constant theme in refugee relief, is, is uh, uh, corruption and the misuse of the funds. And of course, she was uh, accused of this as, as well. well. Collaborate, you know, sort of this word, I think, about Vichy, and that's yes. what really made me yeah. Well, you know, it's I, just such a, it's a strong word. And especially in this period where you're yes. looking at 40 to 42. Well, one has to find something better. Yes. I, I agree. One has to find something better uh, to, to describe her relationship with Vichy uh, uh -huh. officials. Because it, in, in 50, uh, 56, she, she testified at Bill Gates' trial of the Ebiovacion, uh, purification. Uh, yeah. uh, she, she was on obviously intimate terms with him, or very close terms, and even so. Uh, with his wife. How these people function in the context of crisis is a very, very interesting question. And we need to find a vocabulary to describe uh, their behavior. I don't think the collaboration works at all. I agree. Okay, so we have questions from Mary Wynn. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the Bible. 
Although when the Americans landed, and thanks to uh, Dan Lee, I was able to have access to uh, interesting material at the Center for Jewish History in New York, she was close with the American Jewish chaplain, a, an American Jewish chaplain uh, in Casablanca, and made use of his access to American uh, goods, if you will, uh, to help her in her project. She was a woman of many parts. She not uh, easily digital. And it's just reminded me of um, another that you might know, uh, Dr. Delanoy. She was also a feminist. And she, yes. Yeah, she was um, one of the vicious uh, victims. And yes. she she's not Jewish, but, yes. and, uh, but she took a, a, a totally different approach when she became a communist activist. Yes. And, but it, it would be interesting to compare them, but it, it would not be the same kind of yes. background. And not, not to alienate uh, uh, male scholars of this issue, it's not my point. I've already managed to alienate Israeli scholars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to add male scholars. Male scholars. Uh, but even Ben Shepard's book, The Long Road Home, I don't know if any of you know this book, it's a, it, uh, it's very disparaging uh, comments about women relief workers that they uh, that old maids went and did this job that the women were more interested in your you're nodding your head Sophie yeah. you've obviously read that yeah. some of them are really great yeah. um, the, the the role of the women was seen as auxiliary in the Quaker archives you see that there were women just working there themselves to the bone and they were assistants, and they were secretaries, and they were um, uh, minor figures. And uh, it's very hard to make Ellen Casas Benatar into a minor figure, but they managed to do it. The joint managed to do it. And my final question about it is about the talking about the language and, and the connection between the language that developed of yes. saving refugees and yes. the organization. And I wonder if it would be possible to see echoes of of yes. this language in the Marseille, where the, the Jews after them were yes. immigrated to Israel, yes. and, and this idea of saving refugees yes. applied to Moroccan Jews yes. immigrating. Yes. On this is a very, city, very good point. A very good point. I mean, already the iconography of Jews leaving Morocco becomes very similar to the iconography and the photographs of DPs in the camps of. Uh, they no longer have individual personalities. They're usually photographed in in groups, and, and they're standing there heroically with the, you know, with the Israeli flag uh, uh, behind them. And this is very much mimicking the iconography of, of the Jews taken in, the, in, in of the European Jews taken in the DP camps. So uh, I really do believe it, that one can follow through these kinds of illusions uh, between the. Um, the, the representation of Jewish, uh, of European refugees, and the way the Moroccan uh, exodus was was handled post-war, the the templates were already in place. In place I, I would argue. Okay, just, uh, well, I have just a small point and question, and then a, a, a larger issue that you're very interesting and, and multi-layered uh, presentation um, uh, presents. So first is that, did, did you say that um, that she, that Benatar was the only lawyer to bar? The uh, only woman lawyer. Only woman lawyer. Yes. Okay, so. Um, there were a number of lawyers debarred. Right, there was a list of lawyers and, the, and so the footnote to that is when, that, uh, 
and, and I'm sure you saw this, but I think it just reinforces your old pictures when after the American landing, you know, she's appealing the, the authority to be reinstated in the bar and they, they turned her down and she protests that, uh, you know, how, you know, they're reinstating uh, uh, male lawyers but because she's, you know, is it because I'm a woman that, you know, so yeah. that, so that it just, I think, this is in uh, RG uh, 81. Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't reached that letter. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 can, I can even point, you know, it just struck me. This is, this is, this is, uh, this has, this has Su Susan Miller well, all over you. it. I will ask you for um, <laughs> But uh, I want to maybe, it's more of a, maybe an epistemological question of, uh, about comparisons and, you know, the European comparison that, and I, and I think it, I think it's 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 important. It's certainly important to do so. Uh, Daniel' point about collaboration also sort of bring, brings that up. Uh, but I think it, I think in some ways, in sort of casting this as Ashkenazi Sephardi relations in the way in which, uh, and, and and then your, your your remarks at the beginning about how uh, sort of. North Africa's very much been sort of marginalized in the Second World War, but I'm wondering if there may not be a, um, a, a, a kind of risk also in comparison uh, in that, um, you know, the sort of the, the politics of inscribing North Africa into the Shoah story, the Holocaust story, also brings with it a, a certain um, uh, maybe potentially a misconception about the, the 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 local context which you're very attuned to of course and that's what you, you, you want to do do as well so and I think it raises a larger yeah. question of what we're you know what I think this workshop is yeah. trying to yeah. look at as to how to yeah. you know so that the question of collaboration might be one right. you know what one one issue but but also in thinking in terms of uh, you know the post-war yes. uh, refugee question, yes. as well as you, I think, correctly, correctly demonstrate. Uh, you know that it's that it, that it was it was a very different situation. Yes. So um, I think there's a little bit of a tension between, on the one hand, trying to bring this field of studies into the larger uh, historiography of Shoah, yeah. and but also dealing with its particularism at the same time. Um, so that, that's a, you know, a, a comment, a question. A, 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 a. I think it's a question for all of us uh, to, to consider at some point. Uh, also, uh, Samir's uh, presentation uh, raised a similar uh, conundrum, I think. Uh, is, is there a moral equivalence uh, uh, in terms of people's uh, behavior uh, between uh, uh, the various cases that you represent. Can one talk about uh, Satif and uh, Bouffanoir in, in, in the same breath? I think that this is a problem that we, we, we should really be sorting out here. Uh, uh, to what extent are we going to um, capitulate to the natural tendency of those who aren't experts in our area to try to draw comparisons. And so they ask uh, you know, ridiculous questions, pardon me for characterizing this, like why are there no Muslim rescuers? I mean, this is a totally irrelevant uh, question that, uh, uh, that I find uh, really disturbing uh, because it doesn't really take you anywhere. It's not a historical question. It, it's a propagandistic question. It's a question of publicity. But we, we need to think through, I think, very carefully to what extent our particular uh, field of, of study, uh, how it relates to the larger questions of, uh, of moral responsibility, of histor historicity, uh, factual representation, of institutional comparisons, like the camps, uh, the, the Moroccan camps and the Algerian camps were only a milder version. Still, there, there, there are important questions at stake here of the questions of compensation that Yaron uh, referred to, people that are now being raised. Uh, 
I think as, as historians, we have a responsibility uh, to try and uh, take a bite out of those issues and come up with some sort of uh, uh, consensus, if we possibly can, on what, what attitude to take um, uh, regarding our work. Because at the end of the day, we're all uh, in this together, and what we're doing relates to the, to the uh, larger issues about the representation of this, this period and this place. Uh, Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I love this character. Um, and she intersects only very briefly with things that I've been looking at. I have so many questions about her. Um, I'll try to keep it. But one of them is what is her relationship to her Moroccanness in yeah. the sense of working with so many multifaceted refugee populations, herself? In many ways, your implicit argument is enabling the refugee crisis of Moroccan Jewish exodus. Yes. Right? So what is her fundamental relationship to her yeah. Moroccan yeah. identity? Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of criticism from nationalists of yes. her and her science engagement. So yes. can you just touch on that? Well, she was an elitist, you know. I mean, I, I, she, she thought that she, she, she had a particular culture that wasn't particular to her alone, and they were Moroccan. Jews who felt that they were French, uh, and she certainly felt she was French, although she would not deny her Moroccan identity, her pride in being a, a you know, pure Sephardi, uh, her family roots in, in Al-Andalus, uh, her ancestors who were Sephardic rabbis. Uh, this is a very complicated identity you all know is better than as well as I do. Uh, especially coming from Tangier. We know the way Tangier Jews uh, defined themselves against other Jews. The, the Jews of Tangier were uh, uh, Tanjawi, uh, the Jews of the interior were Dahlin or Forasteros or whatever you want to call them. I mean, it runs very deep in, in the mentality of, uh, of the Tangier uh, Jewish community and, and she certainly represents that sort of elitist uh, attitude. At the same time, she was a complex person. She was very compassionate. Um, she didn't. I, she she makes insinuations that these Ashkenazi Jews are really a different species. She she doesn't uh, agree with uh, many of the th ways that they behave. She she finds them an alien uh, an alien race, uh, and uh, she's very Moroccan in, in, in that uh, in that respect. Yeah, on the other hand, I see no mention of relationships with the Muslims in uh, the entire archive, except to speak about Muhammad's and Fatma's they cleaned up after. Yeah. And this is very disturbing. This is very disturbing. It seems like uh, if she had Moroccan friends, maybe people in the business community that she bought supplies from. She worked with Nelson Tan. Yes. Uh, it, 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 she was a very particular species, and I think it not singular at all. There are Moroccan Jews that just, and particularly from Tangier, that we are not in touch with a native society. We have to admit that about her. She's not the poster child for Muslim Jewish relations. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we can learn a lot from Anukazes uh, Abdelatan about uh, about the high bourgeoisie, the Tanjawa high bourgeoisie life. But with your research, we move to what, for me, is um, the real revolutionary panic point of uh, Moroccan Jewry and the impact of of the uh, Second World War. That yes. is the penetration of world Jewry. Yes into the Jewish uh, local communities. And, uh, you know, until the Second World War, Moroccan Jewry was the domain of Alliance Israeli to the That's right. all. And after it, it becomes the scene of intervention for all, for all, all kinds of Jewish organizations, beginning with the joint and, uh, and, and uh, passing by the Zionist, Zionist uh, the Israeli Zionist uh, uh, machineries and uh, parties and youth movements and uh, 
Jewish agency in everything, and, uh, and ending with the with the Jewish Orthodox, the Lithuanian and, and, uh, and Chabad mix, and all sorts. Now, everywhere, this, the, the seeds of the penetrations are already uh, uh, pers pers personalized. By, by some some kind of, of, of agents before, and in the case of uh, of uh, Helen Kazas uh, Benata, she is local agent of the joint during the war. Uh, yes, it's toward the end of the war. Yeah. And then afterwards, she is nominated to be the representative represented for, North Africa. Uh, for all North Africa. Right. For all North Africa, this is a very important. This is a. a, a Made a, a very important uh, uh, post. What happened that took her away from here and gave the uh, uh, post to another person from yes. foreign, uh, foreign America? Yes. Yes. This is, this is uh, yes. one, one very important question because it, it, it happens it everywhere. The, yes. the, the local Zionists yes. give way for yes. Israeli representatives. Yes. yes. Even uh, and it, it, the, lo the local rab rabbinate gives way to orthodox. Yes. So it's it's a, it's a the, re the reflection of the ethnic problem that we find in Israel in in world in, in the world relationships in the Jewish uh, in yeah. the Jewish uh, uh, scene uh, as reflected in Morocco. Yeah. This is very important. Now. I, I would end with uh, my, my, my role as uh, the Israeli gang, I'm not closing. <laughs> but this is, behind it, it, there is something really important, and especially for the young generation. Now, Helen Kazes Benata was thoroughly studied by, by an Israeli scholar. Yes, uh, Ben Yaakov. Michal Ben Yaakov. Yes. And she has already written a big uh, article it's post, yes. post coming. Now, the question, now, much of the Moroccan or North African research is, is done now by Israelis and in Hebrew. And the question is, why should we be marginalized and not learn like the French, and not, not be treated like the French study or the American study or the Arabic study, because we demand from our from our, from our students to learn those languages in order to to study to to, to be able to to study all the the, yes. the, the sources and the and the, yes. and the research. Yes. So why should we be why should we be translated to other languages and not the students who should be able to to read sources? And studies, then he. What is, what is the justification for it? I hope this isn't a question directed at me. It's a matter of. Um, it's, 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 it's the explosion in knowledge that we have today because of the digitization of all of these archives that are now being concentrated in, in one place means that the research time that we devote to writing doctoral dissertations, to writing monographs, is expanded, exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel and I were talking about this uh, uh, yesterday. Yes, the the, the burden on us of the amount of material that we now have to go through is five times what it used to be. And laboring through, I mean, I read Hebrew, but I don't read it as fast as I read English. I, it would take me five times longer to read a Hebrew text than an English text. So I skim it. I don't read it with the same concentration. Therefore, the text in Hebrew is less useful. I, I confess this because I'm not bilingual. I mean, I, I learned Hebrew as an adult. It's less useful to me than a text in, in English or in French, which I read fluently. If Israeli scholars want to be injected into the international discourse that is developing around these topics 
and I hope you won't misunderstand me, Aaron. No, that's alone, that alone the, is already studied. Sources. The, sources. The, we are the, dealing with Their tools. work has to, be, oh. has to be translated. It has to appear at least in synopsis. A, 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 a journal like Peyamin could do uh, summaries of articles so that we, we know what's in the article, and then if it's an important, if it relates to our topic, then we can labor through the media. But right now, we have no guideposts. We have no ways of knowing what's important and what isn't important. And I think, uh, in, in my opinion, it's not a question of national pride. It's a matter of efficiency. And in order to be part of the game uh, of this uh, resource uh, source accumulation, uh, I, I personally, I don't know if others agree with me, uh, this is a, a, a question we all need to discuss, uh, that you can uh, make it easier for us, uh, those, not just Americans, but French, Spanish, this is an international study now. These digitized sources belong to everybody. The Israelis have to get I'll on the bandwagon and become studies. international. What about sources? What's that? I give up studies, okay? Give up? I give up studies, Israeli study, Hebrew studies. I'll talk about sources. Do you so, do you I Hebrew sources? I being, I'm not making myself clear. No, he's talking about sources, and the, the, the manuscripts and the documents. But, but I think it's the... Primary sources. Yeah, primary primary sources. sources. But I think oh. one of the questions that's... So for me, as a, as a Moroccan, for instance, when having access to, to these sources, basically, first of all, they have to start with learning Hebrew. And the infrastructure there is not there. So we have to figure out a way how to change the whole infrastructure, not only in Israeli or European or American universities, to have programs that teach Hebrew and you have to have the funding for it. I don't think it's there yet. I really don't think it's there. Although some people are willing, they really, I know a lot of Moroccans in Moroccan universities who want to study Hebrew, but you don't have the logistic, you don't have the infrastructure for it. And you don't have the fund, the funding for it too. So be beyond the politics, beyond the politics. Modern Hebrew and rabbinic Hebrew are very different. It's a second. It's related. Just to follow to follow up. The I think the question is not about the so. And there's a question of why most of the research conducted in Hebrew. Most of the people that studied uh, Jewish history in Hebrew didn't read Arabic a few years ago. And so it produced a certain kind of approach. And then, so it, I, I don't think there's um, a specific um, um, demand of acquiring a language. But what is necessary is the exchange. This is what's necessary. Because if I read or, or what about devils, it, it's a completely almost, can agree with it. it's a completely, if we are talking about Moroccan history, so people who speak Berber, they have a, another totally different access and approaches, and, and so, so they are, and, and what I, I can agree with you is the marginalization of, of uh, Israel in, in this current political situation, which is another topic with the BDS. And this is a real problem. Because we are detached, we, if we study North Africa, for example, we are detached from our colleagues in Arab countries and sometimes European. And this is very dangerous for the Israeli scholarship, especially because we own this kind of knowledge that the others don't. And, and it's another question of, of, of the boycott of it's there. But the, the, the influence of the boycott about our scholarship are more, even more relevant to discuss now and, and what does the, the Shoah studies, what do we mean with this, the Shoah studies? So people studying the Shoah don't boycott Israel, but if you want to study in a larger um, framework, it, you are limited as Israeli or, or the others. So I don't think that, um, I, I think Israeli should write in English or, or, or in, this is the lingua franca, it's always have been the case for a and, um, and the other access that we, we should think about, you mentioned um, the, the Alliance and then the Zionists and by the end the, the Jewish Orthodox. But there was a Jewish Orthodoxy in Morocco, of course, of course before Alliance. So the another they called to me is not about languages, it, it's about secularism versus 
religion studies that also create for a, me, it is a power, mis- it's a power question. And for me, is Hebrew is a native language, the native's language, kind of, because it started before the BDS. And there is a problem. Why? How come that much, I, I won't speak about the Americans, I'll speak about the French, my French colleagues. How come they know, they, they hardly know English, but they can't, they can't read uh, articles in, in English. They read French, they don't read Arabic, and they don't read Hebrew, and they make studies about Jews of North Africa. Yes, yes. in a particular context, though. Okay, I mean, okay. but that's, that's a problem. That's a problem, and this is a professional problem, not a political or and the, the tendency to marginalize Israeli research is without basis because there, are, there is a lot of output in, in, in our uh, domain. But at, at least about 20 or 30 percent of it, which is a norm, in quantity, enormous uh, number of pages, is worth reading. I don't think anyone questions And that. we do read it when it's in French and Arabic <laughs> and <laughs> in English. I don't think anyone, don't think anyone questions <laughs> the quality and the importance of the Israeli research. I don't think that's what I, 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 I'm trying to say. I think it's important. Yes, I hope no, I'm, I'm not, 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 I'm, I'm for, for the primary sources. That's, that's, that's my main point. It's, I, I can't understand how people study Jewish, Jewish history, especially of so-called traditional societies without mastering Hebrew. Uh, yes, you can speak. Um, <laughs> I know that we, we probably have to close the session. I realize that, so I, could I, I'll make a more maybe optimistic or yeah. uh, po- positive note. I think, I think kind of what we're doing here at this table, but you know, there have been other occasions is that I mean, there are a lot of, you know, linguistic barriers in this in, in this field, and it's a bit very demanding, I think, for people coming from different backgrounds, whether it's North Africa or Israel, and so I think what you're, I think what you're both speaking to in agreement is is uh, the need of collaboration, collaboration across borders, and you know, the BD, you know, I. I, I I was going to point out that, that if anything, North, North Africans uh, who are interested in these topics uh, are not big BDS supporters because they value that collaboration. And I needn't tell people at this table. We've had gatherings, of course, where these issues have come up. Uh, you know, was it uh, over a decade ago in Tangier? <laughs> Some of you were uh, in this room were present. So I think. Um, um, I mean, I think that Yaron's point are very, you know, very well well taken. You know, it's a it's a it's a goal uh, for, uh, for people outside of um, um, Israel working on these issues. I think they they, they they really should work with the, you know, some of the really fine studies in, in uh, Hebrew that are coming out, and certainly, um, uh, and I and I agree that I think. It, it would it would have a larger audience if they were, you know, in in uh, things which aren't. Uh, although I think there's a little bit more than than you might imply. So of Israeli scholars writing in uh, uh, English and French. Um, so, but I but I think that uh, that at this stage of our our research, we uh, you know collaboration is really the way the, the way. To so that's, and I think that's what we're doing here. Well, it's the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes was something like your, like concluding your remarks about the skills of a historian concerning the subject that we are dealing with. I, I had a question, very quick and, and very, very, very uh, uh, short question concerning your, your project. Uh, uh, listening, uh, reading your your uh, your notes and, and, and listening to to your presentation, uh, what 
came up to my mind is that you're dealing with a very, very interesting, I would you say, eye-opening space of refuge, which might be composed out of three different cities, Marseille, Lisbon, and Casablanca, and which might shed light on the whole issue of North Africa during the Second World War, because it's a different space, a completely different space compared with the other places. So just put it well, pushing, even pushing the notion of space yes. during the Second World War into the focus. Yes. Marseille, Lisbon, and Casablanca. Yes. And then you might understand the world well, intervention involving Jewish organization and yes. so on and so forth, yes. which it, because it's a different space. Yes. And it's a, it's a mental space, but it's also a physical space defined by uh, shipping lanes and air, uh, air traffic. That, you know, that I would add Tangier to the project because there was a uh, uh, movement in Tangier as well. Uh, if one starts to talk about the idiom of space, the city itself of Casablanca becomes a very interesting space uh, because refugees were housed all over the city. I have addresses of hotels they stayed at, families they stayed with. One can use the uh, uh, axis of space to understand a great deal about refugee uh, behavior uh, in Morocco. Uh, but that's a Thank you for that. That's a very uh, interesting uh, contribution. And the last question, question from Chaim Salo. I have two questions, two quick questions. First of all, can you estimate the number of Jewish refugees in, in Morocco? Yeah. And the second, how can it come that the only new community that was established during the war was to have the refugees, European refugees, and not even one community that had Moroccan Jews at that time? What can we learn from this situation? Um, the number of refugees in Morocco, we don't know exactly. There were many who came through Morocco who uh, didn't relate at all to the uh, official organizations, so they weren't counted. Uh, the, the numbers I see are between 10 and 20,000, but when you start to add camp inmates, it could go up to 30 or 40,000. And then I've seen some figures as high as 80,000, but that seems very exaggerated to me. But I would say someplace between 20 and 40,000 people we're talking about here who transferred. Uh, Morocco during uh, those uh, those years. But but not, you're not just talking about Jews. Though. No, I'm not yeah. just talking about okay, Jews. I mean, this is a multinational uh, refugee community. I, I mentioned yeah. the Spanish Republicans, the uh, uh, communists. There were, uh, and, and Benatar didn't help just Jews. She helped a lot of different people. Uh, your second question, I'm sorry, was uh, about a new committee that was established yes. during the war. Well, there already were communal organizations in each town in Morocco that were set up. I mean, the, the French region, the, the local community, community uh, the, the structures of local community organizations uh, after the establishment of the protector. And these local community organizations handled the needs of, uh, of Moroccans, of indigent Moroccan Jews. And, uh, they had the, the Kedusha, they had all kinds of uh, communal structures that were already in place. In, uh, during the war, the stress on the Jewish communities in Morocco, besides the implication of the Nishi race laws, was a question of, uh, of uh, supplies. There were uh, ration, well, there was rationing in place, and uh, there were many problems connected with, with, with the issue of rationing of, uh, uh, of, of, of food. Uh, and we have lots of evidence in the archives that the communities tried to deal with. Another problem was the black market, of course, which was an issue that also came out of that. But we shouldn't think that the Moroccan Jewish community was bereft, that it had no support system. It really, Moroccan Jews had a, a very strong support system in place through their local community organization. It must have been fundamentally altered by the issue, like the creation of UGIF, which, which forbade the existence of Jewish communal organizations. They weren't. Not at all. No. No. So he, despite, despite Mujib's existence, had no policy implementation. Well, no, there, were, there were relations with Mujib. There were certain issues that were referred to Mujib in, right. in France. But the, the basic structure of communal organization was intact. They were criti uh, the residency was criticized for not applying that kind of staff structure, but they, they kept the, you know, 
and, and, and you know, I mean, that's what's so amazing. But with the laws, they, they still were maintaining that whole structure, the charitable system. They're talking about, you know, maybe they should raise taxes on kosher meat. This is going on during BG, you know, to, and and it's all going through the, you know, the. The, the French authorities at the yeah. same time. So it's, it's it's one of the sort of paradoxes. Right. Of and the communities were very helpful. Uh, I mean, in uh, finding, uh, in, in helping. Uh, they were very helpful with the refugees. They uh, farmed people out to homes. Sometimes people were paid for housing refugees. Other times they did it charitably. The, the communities rose to the occasion. They took even food to the camps. They took food, food to the camps. They sponsored people. This is a page of Moroccan Jewish history that's not well known and really one that Moroccan Jews are very, very proud of. It's a part of the story that gets to come forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.